Hi everyone, hope you're all keeping well, uh, whether you're in school or whether you're watching this at home. It's Miss McFadden, so I, some of you, most of you actually will probably know me from teaching history as well as being head of Eddy family. I also teach a bit of RE. So this week is our first virtual assembly uh, being delivered to you guys at home for your remote learning. And this week on Wednesday the 27th of January, we mark Holocaust Memorial Day. So I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, the Holocaust, about why we memorialise and remember the events of the Holocaust and how we can link this to our own experiences in your daily lives. So as you guys know, we're unable to be in school and this is an incredibly important topic. So I'm going to deliver this assembly and hopefully you guys will take something from that. So the Holocaust Memorial Trust, I've got the picture there, um, they work to raise awareness of the Holocaust and to educate people so that we don't forget about the atrocities that took place in Eastern Europe from 1933 until 1945. This year's theme for Holocaust Memorial Day is Be the Light in the Darkness. I'm going to explain why that's so important to our lives today uh, so that we adhere to the theme not only while you're listening to my assembly and not only in the half hour after this is fresh in your mind but how you can apply this to your daily lives as well. So let's get started. So as I mentioned um, just in the previous slide this year's Holocaust Memorial Day theme is Be the Light in the Darkness. So this is a call uh, for everyone who is acknowledging Holocaust Memorial Day. It asks us to consider different kinds um, of darkness. For example, identity-based persecution, misinformation, something that you might read on the press, something you might read in the newspapers, on news apps, it might be something that you see on Facebook or on TikTok. Denial of justice, um, different ways of being the light. For example, you could be the light to someone by resisting something, resisting poor behaviour, by showing acts of solidarity with minority groups or by identifying and, and challenging mistruths. So that could be going back to something that maybe you hear a little bit of gossip. It might be that you see something in the news that you know is not true. It might be that your parents share something or see something on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram and you challenge it and go, okay, well, where's that source come from? Why, why can we trust it or why can we not trust it? Uh, so there's increasing levels of denial of the Holocaust of what happens uh, in Europe in the 1930s and 40s and I actually just read an article about how one in 20 people in the UK, this was a, an, a survey that, that took place last year, one in 20 people in the UK don't think the Holocaust happened. Now there's so much overwhelming evidence and, and facts to say that it did happen and I'm hoping that today's assembly you can take something and learn a little bit more about it. So there's so many levels of denial, division and misinformation in today's world it means that we have to stay vigilant against hatred and identity-based hostility. Changes to technology, a turbulent political climate and world events beyond our control can leave us feeling helpless and insignificant. The unprecedented times that we're living through just now are showing the very best of which humanity is capable. But also, in some of the abuse and conspiracy theories that are being spread online, there's also the much darker side to our world as well. Now, I know that seems like quite a lot of kind of content and big words I just spoke about there but I'm hoping that over the next couple of slides and over the next 10 minutes or so I'll be able to break that down and explain that to you in a little bit more detail. So I want to start off by saying that we can all stand in solidarity. This is something that I see you guys do in the academy every single day. I see you supporting each other in your classes, I see you in tutor, I see you outside your learning environment, I see you around in the diner, I see you absolutely everywhere. And even when you guys are leaving school at the end of the day, I see you guys being supportive towards one another. So let's let's really take this theme um, and apply it to reflecting on the Holocaust and, and looking forward and teaching people about the Holocaust, but to everything that we do in our daily lives. So what is Holocaust Memorial Day and why do we acknowledge it? Well, it happens on the 27th of January every single year. And that is because that is the day that Auschwitz, the one of the biggest, well, the biggest um, and most notorious Nazi death camp, uh, that's the day that that was liberated, that it was freed. So that's why we remember it. And last year celebrated 75 years since the liberation of Auschwitz. So Holocaust Memorial Day is a time where we work to learn the lessons of the past and recognise that genocide doesn't take place on its own. So genocide and holocaust are two words that are really closely linked and I'll talk to you a little bit about that in the next slide. 
genocide is a steady process which can begin if discrimination, racism and hatred are not checked, are not challenged and are not prevented. And that's something that didn't happen in Europe, in Nazi Germany, that then took over different parts of Europe that wasn't challenged from the years 1933 when Hitler came into power right up until 1945 and the end of the Second World War. So um, I'm going to move on and explain a little bit more about those key words that we'll be talking about today. So the word Holocaust, it actually comes from an ancient Greek meaning and it means burnt offering. Even before the Second World War, that word was sometimes used to describe the death of a large group of people. But since 1945, it's become almost synonymous, so almost kind of um, the exact same thing or, or in line with the murder of the European Jews during the Second World War. That's why we use the term the Holocaust. Jews also refer to it as the with the word Shoah. And some of you guys might remember that from Year 7 RE. We cover that in quite a lot of detail in Year 7 RE. The word Shoah, that's Hebrew for catastrophe, and that's the, the traditional Jewish language. The deliberate and systematic destruction of a group of people because of their ethnicity, nationality, religion or race. So that was the, the, the groups of people that were killed by the Nazis in these concentration camps. So Jews, uh, people who were gay, people who were intellectuals, people who were disabled. It was the mass destruction of these groups of people. Uh, so the mass destruction, destruction, destruction of those groups of people was given a name and the name for that destruction was called genocide and it was created by a lawyer called Raphael Lemkin and he was a Polish born lawyer. Genocide, that was made a crime that was punishable under international law in December 1946. It's difficult to kind of understand that that word or that, that crime didn't exist until after the Second World War. So it's actually quite a relatively new word and term. The Holocaust uh, that we talk about so commonly now and that we know about um, in the form of concentration camps in Eastern Europe in the 1940s were created after a Nazi conference in 1942 uh, and that was decided as the final solution and it was at the Von C conference in January 1942. So we're really fortunate in the UK that we're not at immediate risk of genocide. However, discrimination hasn't ended, neither has the use of hatred or exclusion in communities. There's still so much to do to create a, a, a safer future and this assembly is an opportunity for you guys to reflect and to start in this process. I also want to note that although I'm going to be focusing on the Holocaust that took place in Europe eh, in the 1930s and 40s, that it's important to mention other genocides that have happened throughout history as well. Eh, so in Rwanda, Bosnia and Darfur. Now, those of you who are a little bit more eagle-eyed, you might have noticed that I had this quote on two, two slides earlier. And this is actually the quote that's kind of backing up the theme of being the light in the darkness for this year's Holocaust Memorial Day. So this is actually from a survivor of the Holocaust, from Gina Turgel, um, and she died sadly in 2018. So she said, we will continue to do our bit for as long as we can, securing the knowledge that others will continue to light a, t light a candle long after us. So that fits in with the idea of light, and I'm gonna kind of explain that in a little bit more detail and break it down for you guys. So I've chosen to pick that um, and put that on the slide. Uh, because this idea of light in the darkness is particularly important to you guys. You guys are the last generation, you're the last group of young people to have a direct link to the past. And by that I mean that you guys are the, the last kind of generation of young people that will have been alive at the same time as these survivors because we're closely getting to the point of it being 80, 90, 100 years since the Holocaust. So it's really sad for me to say but within a few years all of those who experienced the Holocaust won't be with us any longer. The only piece of information I could actually find that told me about how many people survived or, or that are still, um, still alive from the Holocaust was from last January. And it said that there's only 400,000 Holocaust survivors left. And that number will have gone down um, in the past year. Soon it'll be left to those of us that are left, th those of us that are here, uh, to educate others about what happened during the Holocaust. So I know I bang on about this all the time and I've mentioned it in other assemblies before, um, particularly to do with remembrance and the Holocaust. But if we don't learn from the past and if we don't talk about what happened in the past, then we can repeat it. And we don't, we don't want that. We need to learn from our previous mistakes. We've seen social media campaigns in the past year, particularly with lockdown, about being kind, about being compassionate towards others. 
uh, and showing gratitude toward those around us and le and learning about the experiences of those through the Holocaust. We can acknowledge and respect the horrors that we went through, that they went through and ensure something on this scale never happens again. The picture on the bottom of this slide here that actually shows the design, it's not actually built yet, but it shows the design of a Holocaust memorial that is hoping to be built in London, just near the Houses of Parliament. Uh, so you can see there, it's kind of like big pillars. So it's 23 bronze fin uh, fins or pillars with, with 22 spaces in between. And they represent the 22 countries that had their Jewish populations wiped out in the Holocaust. So um, I actually read a book called The Librarian of Auschwitz and it's the story of a young girl named Dita uh, from Czechoslovakia who was imprisoned at age 14 uh, in Auschwitz uh, and because she was a Jew. And I think it links in with a the theme of be the light in the darkness. As for Dita, she was viewed to be the light in the darkness for many, many young people and actually a lot of adults who were around her um, in the camp. So she was place, placed in block 31 in camp B2B and that was known as the children's wing. The children's wing was seen to be a light in the darkness for many people who lived there and I'm going to tell you why. So in this area of the camp uh, there were tables, chairs and there were many family, families who lived there. The elders in the camp, the older people who lived there, many of whom had had some level of education before the Holocaust or before they'd been imprisoned, um, became teachers. They were also known as counsellors. There were three classes of children, so there was like the youngest, the middle, and the oldest. And the teachers demonstrated lots of different ha uh, lots of different skills that they could have learned. So, for example, they would write traditional the traditional Jewish language of Yiddish in the ground with a stick, um, because it was really dusty, so they could write out like that. Or they would write in Hebrew so that the children could learn about their heritage. Uh, other lessons included maths and history of the Jewish people, and. These lessons provided the children and their parents with hope and light for the future. That the children were being prepared for life outside the camp, but that this was only, only temporary about where they were living and, and the treatment that they were experiencing, and that one day they would be free. The area they lived in, in this camp of constant suffering, eh, this provided hope for the, the families of the children as well. Because when outside of the lessons, they lived in constant fear. For example, I'm, for example, I'm going to give you some examples now of how they were treated in the camp. Men were given around 1,200 calories worth of food a day. A, a man's recommended intake is around 2,500 calories a day. So because of this level of starvation, this led to extreme mal malnutrition and it led to the deterioration of their bodies, leading to a slow death. If a prisoner looked weak, sometimes they were just shot. In the daily roll calls, which was like a register, uh, the campmates would be forced to stand in formation, they'd be forced to stand in lines, uh, which in the winter, the temperatures in these places in Poland, it could be up to minus 10 degrees. And when they were standing out there, they only had their camp uniforms on and often they didn't have any shoes. This idea of education of the children's wing in Camp 2B2, uh, 2B2B uh, was viewed to be a light in the darkness. Because in 1944, in the month of September, in Block 31, in Camp B2B, not a single child died. There were other camps within Auschwitz that surrounded them where children, they've lost up to 5,000 children in those camps due to disease, starvation and exhaustion. So going back to Dita, she was viewed to be the light in the darkness for many within the camp. She became known as the camp's librarian. She was viewed by the leader of the camp to be intelligent, to be mindful of those around her, and she was given the responsibility of hiding the small collection of books that the campmates had managed to smuggle past the guards. The camp's library consisted of eight books, including A Short History of the World by H.G. Wells, um, a Russian grammar book and a Greek philosophy book. What's quite interesting though, is that by doing this, Dita put herself at risk, but she provided hope for so many people around her. She was entrusted to hide the books in a different place every single night. And that was so dangerous. It was really, really dangerous for her. She effectively put her life on the line every single day. Not only did she have to hide them, she had to trans transfer them around the area to give them to the different teachers. Over time, she actually collected scrap material so that it could be sewn into the insides of her, her garments so that she could fit the books in and carry them around without being spotted, without holding it in her hand. 
these steps that she took helped keep the camp B2B alive. It gave them hope. Uh, it gave the people that she was around hope for the future outside of Auschwitz. Although to Dita, as I said earlier on, she did live in daily fear of, of what could happen if she was caught. Now, the reason that I've, I've chosen to mention the story of Dita will become clear to you in a second. Um, I've got the book here and there's a quote that is right in the beginning of the book and I'm going to read this out to you. It's by um, uh, an American author called William Faulkner and it says, Literature has the same impact as a match lit in the middle of a field in the middle of the night. The match illuminates li relatively little, but it enables us to see how much darkness surrounds it. As I said, that's a quote from William Faulkner, who's an American author. Think about what that means. Literature has the same impact as a match lit in the middle of a field in the middle of the night. Literature, a uh, learning can set a fire. A lot of your te a lot of your teachers might remember when they were at uni. They might remember this quote where it says, "Education isn't the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire." And I think that signifies the importance of Dita's role in the children's wing. Uh, it brings us back nicely to this year's Holocaust Memorial Day theme. Be the light in the darkness. Be a light of positivity for those people around you in your community. I've told you guys about a teeny tiny part of the history of the Holocaust and the experiences of some people who were in the camps. It's now down to you guys uh, to spread the word about what happened and challenge any racist behaviour or misinformation that you come across in your daily lives. Use your education to tell others about what you've learned, whether it's from history or English or science or maths, go and tell people about what you've learned. Go and tell people about what's happened in the past because I guarantee you that we need to learn about what happened in the past in order to prevent it from happening again. Believe in your own voice because out of many books I've read in the Holocaust, I've read The Librarian of Auschwitz, The Choice, The Tattooist of Auschwitz, The Day the Nazis Came, there's one common theme that comes out of every single one of those books and it's hope, it's positivity, it's light. Even after years of hardship and darkness, there's always something to be positive about. There's always something to work towards. Now I'll place some other links and videos onto the family classrooms so that you guys can have a little bit more of a look or, or watch some videos if you're interested in this. Thank you if you've made it the whole way to the end of this assembly. If you've got any questions, please email me. I'm more than happy to support your learning in this. And yeah, hopefully I'll see you all, all of you guys soon.